Good evening, everybody. My name is Charlene Williams. I come from the Aquapsum village of the Skokotmish people. I am from Skokotmish, Sanaimo, and Nuchanath descent. I'm respectful in my being, and I'm thankful to see you all here today and grateful to all of my relations. Um, I've been uh, asked by uh, my dear friend Tomo to come and uh, open the event with a traditional welcome uh, and welcoming you to the traditional territory of the Skokomish people. And thank you, uh, Tomo, for the honor of being able to, to be here, invited to be here to open in this way and to speak at your event. And I've dragged along with me my two helpers. I don't know if you guys want to introduce yourselves. Um, Hawks Well, Cedar Queens Na. Um, my name is Cedar, and I'm Thomasina's daughter. Hawks Well, Jasmine Queens Na. Tanakshin Pla. Equapsum Oakmail. Ananakshin Squalwin. Tanquam and Komi. Hi, my name's Jasmine. and. I'm a daughter. <laughs> <laughs> She's been drug along. <laughs> but I get snacks. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we'd like to start by uh, our evening in a good way um, by sharing a welcome song. Uh, the song that we're going to share is called Hopo Chael. Uh, and this song comes from a uh, Skokomish woman from the Upper Squamish Valley. Um, way upper Squamish Valley, uh, where there's actually uh, uh, no longer any Skokomish villages. Um, but this song was uh, gifted by the Skokomish women to a delegation of chiefs from all over BC um, who went to England in 1906 to meet with the king. And they went because 
what was happening in their communities, they, they knew it wasn't right and that it wasn't fair and they wanted to fight for our rights. And this is at a time when it was actually illegal for them to represent their nations as hereditary chiefs. But they went anyway and they, the women of the communities, they wove them uh, robes of mountain goat wool. And they went to plead with the king for the rights um, of their people and for future generations. And I often tell the children when I teach them the song, I remind them that those chiefs were thinking of them. They were thinking of us and had our um, best interests at heart when they went to go and plead with the king. And so the chiefs of BC sang this song um, to the king of, king of England in 1906. Um, and at that time, the king had promised the chiefs that all land claims would be settled within 10 years. It's well over 100 years ago. <laughs> but nevertheless, it's a reminder to us about um, the chiefs, our leadership, who was thinking of us and wanting the best for us um, many generations ago. And so it talks about, um, it says, and so it's saying, I'm holding you up high, you're highly respected people, all of you. And we raise our hands in this way. Well, I only have one, but she can show you. We raise our hands in this way. And it's a symbol for two things. It means welcome. So oftentimes you'll see poles hang, holding their hands up like this. And it's showing welcome and it also means thank you. Um, so showing gratitude. Um, so if you so choose, we will raise our hands and welcome to you and you can thank us back for, wel for your, our welcome. <laughs> this is Hope Hope Chess. <laughs>
Uh, my name is Kazza Pureway. I am the very honored last minute moderator of uh, two hours ago. <laughs> so I am <laughs> so I am underqualified and overdressed for this event, <laughs> um, but but I'm excited to be here nevertheless. Um, there's a couple of reasons why I've agreed to be here. One is because I adore, adore Tano and have seen what she's done for our community um, and her ongoing work uh, to make us all think outside the box and look deep within ourselves, um, especially what is going on with our community. So I couldn't say no. Um, second, I have been living on and off, but mainly on in Squamish um, for the past 18 years. I cannot call myself a local yet. However, my both my kids, 16 and 14, have been born here, and I guess they are locals. So um, I'm here in solidarity with all the community wondering um, what is in our near future. And thirdly, I always like to put on a good shirt, and so in solidarity with our fish. So, here we go. So first of all, um, a little bit of housekeeping and agenda. So COVID restrictions, as this is our new life here, masks on if you are not sipping your tea or drinking your food. Um, and you must be remain seated if eating or drinking. So, um, the next little while, uh, we will be um, introducing three short films on good change happening now, uh, followed by an introduction to Thomasina, um, who many of you will already know, um, and introduce, introducing three local stories, and introducing a few people that will tell a little bit about their stories um, of this area. Um, and then I'm going to be introducing our panel members and with a couple of um, questions. And as a moderator, I'll be reading those questions um, and inviting the speakers to, to say their part. And I will be very strict on time, cutting them off when they need to be. <laughs> so um, without uh, further ado, um, please uh, enjoy our three short ones. We in the global north, with less than 20% of the population, are responsible for over 70% of global emissions. We are drilling all over the place. On the other side of the world, those people who are the most affected by climate change, most affected by environmental injustice, have the least responsibility for creating this crisis in the first place. In the Lama Bhattu, sir, you need to know, you need to not talk to the bus. The amount of fossil fuel that we're combusting year on year is growing. We're going in completely the wrong direction. I've spent six years wandering through the wreckage caused by the carpet in the air and the economic system that put it there. That old paradigm will be forced into change, either by the environment around us or by us. You see communities who are thrown into the front line. Hear the incredible transformation. They become stronger, they stand up. So here's the big question. What if global warming isn't only a crisis? What if it's the best chance you're ever gonna get to build a better world? Change or be changed? There are limits. Let's celebrate the limits because we can reinvent a different future.
I'd never thought about climate change for a long time. But about 2005, I went to a talk at the Hay Festival where they were discussing climate change and the implications for the future. And I began to realize this is getting quite serious. I could hear that companies are doing things. I mean, Avis, the car company, was trying to do something at the time and various other people. But I thought, what's society doing? Is anybody doing anything? Millions of people. We had to do something. 
So we traveled around the globe looking for the men and women who are offering creative alternatives. So it's so hard. We didn't start with, shall we say, the planet, because that was too grand. We just start with where we are. There is no perfect democracy or economic models, and what seemed to emerge from our journey was a new vision for the world, where each community is more autonomous, therefore more free. Nous avons tout à la main sur un tout petit territoire qui peut prendre autant qu'avec un tracteur sur un territoire dix fois plus grand. San Francisco has an 80% landfill conversion rate. Everything is reduced, reused, recycled, or composted. See the final show. These people are writing a new story. They're saying it's not too late, but we have to get moving now. Now we want the dollar. And if we give it everything we've got, if we all join our forces and our hearts, we can all start to change the world tomorrow. Uh, in Tottenham, we have a 21 pound note. Kind of 21, because you can, why not? <laughs> <laughs> and I just want to say thanks to everyone for coming. It's super cool. Um, so I got this thing written, and I'm going to try to say it uh, within a certain amount of time, but I probably won't be able to because it's kind of long. So apologies, but I got a lot to say. So let's begin. <laughs> um, okay, so although the theme of changing Squamish appears to be about housing, if we look deeper, we can see that these issues are just mirror side effects of a system larger than anything that we can imagine. But rather than spend much of my time repeating what I've already written on the walls and on my social media and stuff, I will just start with how this project began. So when I first started taking photos of what I call the madness in 2017, I really didn't know what I was doing. All I knew was that what's going on was wrong and it was crazy and uh, it was bigger than me. Um, it was chaos in action. And council had just approved the development of the three condos just behind here that totally block the view of the chief from Loggers Lane. And um, it just seemed like everything was out of control. Um, so the day that I took the photo, the Sea of Sky development, which is just at the entrance, the big one, um, I swindled my way past this office lady woman who was kind of like checking to make sure that I was allowed to be there. And of course I wasn't, but I made up something and she let me in. And then after 20 minutes of roaming around, like with my camera and flip flops, um, eventually the guy who looked like the head boss came up to me and was like, what are you doing here? And I'm like, uh. <laughs> and so I had to make up something about what I was doing, which kind of answers what this is about. So I was basically documenting um, this madness, like the, the development in Squamish. And um, yeah, and I just like, he, so I didn't, he didn't believe me. And so I was like, oh, who do you work for? And I was like, well, he's either going to kick me out or, um, and he's not going to believe that I work myself or that's not going to be good enough. So I just said, well, you know, uh, CBC. <clears throat> and um, he uh, complimented my camera then and, you know, let me proceed. So that was kind of interesting. Um, yeah, but it, so that was like a fun day because I just, there was a lot of nice things. The light was awesome. Um, but that was not, they weren't all fun. Um, there's one area that I visit quite a bit and it bothers me the most, and that's called Chiawas. Sharp, forgive me if I'm saying it wrong. <laughs> um, it was following it was like following devastation in action, and it was super heartbreaking to watch, and it still is because it's ongoing. And Chiawas means raising paddle, and before colonial powers arrived on this land, it was pristine marshland, and it was where the Squamish nation went harvested their herring world. Um, I imagine that it probably looked like what the estuary looks like now after it went rehabilitation. Um, but more commonly, it's known to us as Nexon, and it was home of the chloral alkyd plant, which Chiawas vein, which filled Chiawas veins with toxic waste of the pulp and paper industry, another extractive industry. And so now, under the guise of progress, they're calling it the oceanfront development, too, which to me is also just um, another form of industry. Um, and yet what pains me about Chiawas and watching it undergo the changes, it's not because of what it was 
or even what it became, but it's because of what it's going to become. Uh, it's a constant reminder that humans just don't seem to learn. And this, despite the district and developers using words like sustainability and climate emergency spewing out of their mouths, um, the trajectory has not changed at all. And so, yeah, Naxin is a former toxic wasteland, sure. Um, and the, sure, the project's been in the work for years. And yeah, sure, it'll create some jobs, but that's not the point. The whole point, like these arguments just miss what I'm trying to say. And what, at what expense is what I'm trying to ask? At what expense are all these projects happening? Um, yeah, and just because Chiu is, is an industrial wasteland, I mean, it doesn't make it okay to keep damaging it, to keep taking it, to keep pounding those pile drivers into the soil um, just because it's a more accepted form of development or because it's going to um, create housing, because that's not really what's going on here. Um, also, like Nexon is our non pristine entrance to the, the ocean, and it offers the rawness of the elements in action. It's where I go when I want the wind to blow through me and to feel like the my the coldness run through my veins so I can feel alive. It's not somewhere where I want to go and feel the comforts of coffee shops and museums, um, which is what it's going to be turning out. If anyone hasn't checked out what's going on in there, I highly recommend it. It's a gigantic project. Um, yeah, and so non pristine nature is a word that Leanne Betta Simpson has uh, talked about, and it just means like land that was previously destroyed. And her argument is that land that's previously destroyed needs love too. It needs healing and it needs to be given attention so that it can be revitalized just like broken humans. Um, yeah, but the oceanfront development is not that. It's like the oceanfront development is just side, a side effect of a huge problem, an economic system that works without regard for people in place. And it's not what I would consider progress. And unfortunately, similar projects like this are replicating themselves all over Spanish and all over the world. Which brings me back to the project. So I kept going with this because while well, the construction sites never stopped, and more people were saying, oh yeah, that's, they were, I was really tired of hearing people say, oh, well, what can we do? That's progress. And I'm like, well, you know what? This is not progress. And I really believe that people can make change if we all kind of stood up and as those films had showed. Um, and I studied political science. And as I learned more about how the system works, like political science is basically the study of power. And a lot of this is power in work. And um, if we can take that power back to where it belongs, which is in the people, I think that we can really do the things that we need to do. Um, but yeah, so underneath, but underneath that power, there's three counselors here right now. So underneath the power that these guys hold, there's humans. And us humans voted for these humans. And humans are making important decision making, including all of us. We're all making decision making. We're all making decisions throughout the day that impact other humans and non-humans, like the earth, the water, the soil. And humans can be incredibly greedy and insecure, and many want to profit from this place, which to me is... <laughs> um, but they can also be generous and kind and caring. And so how do we mix humanity in the face of power and greed? And yeah, these are heavy topics. Not many people want to get into them, but obviously you guys do, so that's cool. And you know the problems we face are really big. So um, I thought, so how do we how do we get people that don't seem to care engaged? And so then I was like, oh, photographs. Like, so people need to care. In order to make people care, you need to make them feel and have emotion. And so to go along with all the pretty photographs that are already existing in Squamish, I decided to add a few disturbing ones to pull the heartstrings and expose this madness for what it is. And um, and hopefully, as our humanity humanity <laughs> is drawn, um, I opens up to what's going on. We can pay attention to the forces of our time and talk about these difficult issues that affect me every day, and I'm sure they affect everybody every day. But history has proven, and I know this from political science, that the government does not like people who have power. They get shut down. Emma Goldman once said, if voting actually worked, they'd make it illegal. Um, I know we have a really awesome politician in the house. <laughs> Take no offense. <laughs> um, so beyond our limited democratic means of voting and civil disobedience, um, I just encourage that everyone we start paying attention to what's happening. And because the moment we don't, we're going to lose it. I mean, we saw this happen in the States, and it's still happening. And it's happening here, too. It's just a little more subtle and a little bit more obvious, and people don't talk about it, but we need to. Um, Trump didn't get into power by nothing. So. Um, yeah, so this project is just about learning to be in the world in a new way, just as, as much as it, it is about taking our power back. 
And as you saw in the videos, this is possible. Squamish, we just need to like dig our muscles, make our muscles a little bigger, put it aside the complacency and work a lot harder. Um, so if anyone joining here tonight is on council, hopes to be on council or is a developer, I truly hope that you can learn how to do your job in a better way for both the human and non-human world. Um, so to get on with it, uh, I just want to give a shout out to some of the people that helped me with this. Um, lots of people in the background, obviously. Um, but the people on the street who I met who shared their story, like Mike down the road, the Christmas tree house, I'm sure you guys are familiar with it. Um, his story is really similar to the old man in Up. He uh, basically, his house is sold, the garden, community garden is sold, which breaks my heart because I, I have a food plot there and I'm not going to, it's, um, anyway, so he's basically pressured to sell his house that he grew up in. He didn't want to, but he's like either be faced with gigantic boners, um, shattering his house or sell the basically his home. Basically, he was pushed out. Um, but yeah, so thanks to those guys who helped kind of make me think a little more about how this actually impacts real people. Uh, thank you to Len Yao, Andy Ro Amy Romer, Dave Humphreys, who improved my digital skills further than the darkroom. Um, Amy Romer, <laughs> sorry, for getting the story out into the Tai. Uh, and Len Yao and Ben Hardin for their long hours of helping with framing and hanging photos at the various venues. Uh, huge thanks to the foyer gallery in the library, the Green Olive Cafe, they're in the back there, and the ledge for uh, letting me, providing a neutral place to put these photos. It wasn't actually easy to find a spot. It took quite a while. Um, moreover, a huge thanks to the Squamish Arts Council for, they actually got a grant for this project. So thanks to them for supporting this project through the Community Enhancement Grant. Um, for me, community enhancement means bringing, like shining light on the beautiful, but it also means inspiring a better way. And supporting a controversial project um, is, uh, it takes courage and it's also a bit risky for them or risky in general, but art can be more than pretty pictures and it can be used to challenge our comfort zones to create real change. And so when such pieces are no longer supported or worse, they're censored or banned, then we know that it's been successful. So thanks to the Squamish Arts Council for supporting this important work. I think they're on Zoom. <laughs> Um, yeah, and thanks to everyone here who showed up and for showing to me that people care, because sometimes it just feels like people don't. And uh, to those on social media who supported me, and also those who made comments that challenged me, they really kind of made me think, okay, this person doesn't get it, so I'm going to try to say it in a different way. So I've tried to say things in a different way, but basically in the end, it's the same thing. Um, yeah, so Last but not least, thanks to the Ledge for letting us host this year and to the volunteers who helped make it happen, especially some last minute ones, and to the panelists, my dear friend Charlene Joseph, who taught me more than she may ever realize, uh, Nick Gotolep, <laughs> sorry, I knew I was going to ruin your last name, um, a co he's a co-conspirer of mine in the fight for the rights of vehicle residents, um, which is actually just another side effect of the same problem. Uh, Abby Lewis, who I cannot believe agreed to be here, so thanks, <laughs> and Dr. Peter Hall, who um, his amazing work I discovered through a paper that he wrote on waterfronts, and a part of it was on this, the oceanfront development, and to my good friend Paz, who so kindly agreed to moderate at the last minute. So um, yeah, so let's get this thing going and move behind the mindset that less bad is good, and let's find a way so we can take our power back. So we, as we, as a community, can ignite a deep change that respects people and place. So I'd like to introduce, um, first of all, Emmanuel Timpet to share a little bit about uh, his, his experience with Squamish and change. Hi everyone, hope everyone's doing well. So I've been climbing here since uh, 1987. So uh, that's how long uh, I've enjoyed this, this place here. But Thomasina asked me to say a few words and uh, I think it's because I've been involved for uh, 20 years in sustainability. I've attended two UN Earth Summits, and I have a degree in community planning and studied under Bill Rees, you may know, he invented the ecological footprint. Um, so I've been quite alarmed by the, the development trends here in Squamish and just seeing where the development is happening as well. 
I'll just cite a few examples. So there's the Bailey Street development. So that's just along the train tracks. There's gonna be 200 units, I believe. And it's literally right on the train tracks where tra trains come and crash, you know, and where the locomotives idle and honk their horn. I don't know who, who would ever wanna live there. I just, I just think it's quite atrocious, but it's also a monolith building. It spans three blocks. There's no view corridors. Uh, so I'm quite concerned about that, that kind of development. Another one is just happening across Corsa. I don't know if you've seen the pictures of that in, in the media here, but it looks like uh, an assembly of different clown tents. It's, it's, um, I just don't see Squamish in that type of building. Uh, but then there's also the, the big developments around Qu uh, Crumpet Woods North and uh, the Great Garibaldi Estates North. So that's just going to promote urban sprawl with single family homes. Uh, you know, car dependent communities, you're destroying habitat and ecosystems. It's also our trail network. It's fabulous trails for hiking and, and mountain biking, and that'll be taken away. Uh, and let's not forget the, the war that's being waged on the vehicle residents. Uh, a bylaw was passed in May that makes it uh, essentially illegal for them to, to live in their vehicles, and bylaw officers can assign fines of $10,000 and tow their vehicles. So it causes a lot of stress as well. Uh, I, I just think the district could do so much better. Like, honestly, they, they could be so much more innovative in, in their community planning and design in, in, in the types of buildings that they want to see here and, and also be more inclusive. I mean, the word inclusive is in the official uh, community plan, but uh, I'm not, just not seeing it in, in, in on the ground right now. So there is a building boom in Squamish, and actually that's a great opportunity. It's, it's huge leverage because people, the developers see a good return on investment. So they wanna build here. So you can be a lot more demanding for the types of buildings that will come up. You know, if you wanna build here, just wow us with your sustainable buildings, your innovations, uh, you know, or else you can't come here. So what does that look like? Well, uh, you know, the passive, you know, let, let's let's see some passive house um, buildings. You know, they're they're net positive. They're regenerative. Uh, we have to move away from green, from lead, from net zero. That's not enough, actually, in today's world. We got to go a lot beyond that. And if you want to know what that looks like, go to the Van Dusen Visitor Center in Vancouver. It's a beautiful building, and it integrates these living uh, building challenge principles in that building. It also means Oh yeah, I don't want to forget this because the, the buildings are a very important part of, of you know uh, Canadian life. We spend ninety percent of our time indoors, so we need good indoor air quality. Buildings are responsible for twenty to thirty-five percent of greenhouse gas emissions. You know, so we need to work on the buildings. They tell the story of our community, who we are, what our values are. They also log us into the future. Because just think of these buildings going up. We say they're fairly green. They're not. It's crap. I've, you know, I've spent time in, in Sweden, I've time, spent a lot of time in France, in Germany. I, I've seen what good quality buildings uh, look like in innovative buildings, and they don't have to cost a lot. Um, it's just a question of who bears the cost, you know, not the developer, but it's us as a society and as individuals later as well. So that brings up the point of the importance of retrofitting existing buildings. A lot of these buildings have been built at a time when energy was extremely cheap. So they're very poorly insulated, single pane windows, there's virtually no insulation. So a lot of work needs to happen there. We also need to protect our green spaces, you know, and build on brownfields. Uh, the official community plan, you know, has an urban containment boundary, but it includes huge swaths. I mean, the, the, that uh, Garibaldi Estates North is part of that urban boundary, but it's, it's, it's a huge piece of green space. We should not be developing that right now. Um, we also need to be a lot more inclusive and support diversity. So, so housing for all types, for, for you know, people who are single, their families, multi-generational. Some people have their grandma live with them. You know, they, we need to plan for, for that. Uh, we need to, to plan for the vehicle dwellers. You know, Thomas Cena and, and uh, a whole crew of people have proposed a permit system. I think it's a very good idea. It brings them into the fold. It helps them feel included and, and like they contribute and we can also provide the amenities that support them. But we also have to support the visitors. The municipal campground was closed this summer. It was very hard for me to, to camp, uh, you know, for a number of years here. 
So, so that, that needs to be considered. And finally, I just want to say there's, we need a holistic approach. It's really good that there's bike paths coming in. You know, there's potential setbacks from buildings to create wider sidewalks, but we need to think beyond that. We need to look at how the buildings interact with each other. We need to think about potential district energy systems, for example, like what's happening around Falls Creek in Vancouver. I just want to end on the importance of being involved and having a say. You raised that point, Thomasina. She brought us together here, you know, and, and so let's let's do something. You can write to the planning department, it's very easy, planning at squamish.ca. You can write to the council, council at squamish.ca. You can voice your concerns. Tell them just not what you don't want to see, but what you want to see as well. You know, it's, it's got to go both ways. And if you go to squamish.ca, you can see, uh, you know, if you type development showcase, it's actually quite well done. You have a map of Squamish and you can click on different colors and it shows you the different developments that are happening. So uh, kudos for making it, you know, fairly clear and simple on that front. Thank you. Thank you so much, Emmanuel. Uh, and second, I have Rebecca. Sorry, I don't know your last name. Pryor, yeah. Rebecca Pryor. Hi, everyone. Hi. I'm really nervous. I'm not a public speaker, and I didn't know I'd be speaking until I got here. <laughs> so um, bear with me. Um, so I was born here in Squamish as a settler. Um, and I, I love it here so much, but I've been kind of filled with dread the last the year I've been home. I moved to Jojage, also known as Montreal, on the Kanikahaga territory. Um, and I kept telling people, it's like, come to my small town. Like, it's so amazing. There's such a good community and we take care of each other. But being here now, it doesn't feel like that anymore. There's a lot loss of safety. Everything's more expensive. <laughs> I don't think I could live here if I didn't rent from my parents. Um, and yet, losing the views, the chief, um, Nexon, uh, I used to run to Nexon as a little kid. I'd run away from home and I'd go to Nexon and I'd strip my clothes off and run in the water. And now if I did that, I'm sure someone would call the police. Um, so just everything's changing and I'm, I'm kind of losing hope, but these videos and hearing people talk, Maybe there is some hope. Um, maybe we don't have to run away, which I was kind of planning on. Um, yeah, I, and I just got a job at the Women's Center, which has been really amazing. But one thing I'm seeing there is single moms don't have places to live. Um, they're coming in and they're getting support just to pay rent for one more month at a time. Um, so this isn't safe. Um, you know, we talk about people who are high risk in society, but it's the systems that make people high risk and we have to be holding politicians accountable. Um, yeah, that's, that's all I got for now, but um, thank you everyone. <laughs> Uh, do we have Paul Kindry here? I will be Paul Kindry for right now then, and I will tell you my story. So um, I arrived in Squamish about 18 years ago um, as a wannabe climber, never very good, but I was attracted to the outdoors and the adventure and the small community feel. Um, I arrived uh, with quite a lot of um, smell from the uh, from the pulp mill down the road that would waft in, that was about yeah, 17 years ago, um, as well as driving into town for the first time, there was a big sign saying, um, uh, there was a big sign saying information evening at Brennan Park for, um, for the, the use of some kind of drug that was, that was circulating around the top town and i fell in love not for those reasons um, believe it or not but i fell in love with a community that had small farmers markets that got to know we got to know everybody really quickly and um there was definitely a diversity in 
political views in backgrounds um, where everybody really, I felt like it was a really um, united community. And, you know, I've, I've mainly been here for those, for those um, 18 years. My, my first was born here 16 years ago. Um, and, and my 14 year old, we've kind of gone elsewhere and back. And, um, you know, I, I, we, we never thought we'd be able to survive here because uh, I guess 16 years ago, I thought about, we thought about buying a place when I first was born and, and uh, we were offered a rent to buy which is what they did back then, and I couldn't believe that they wanted 300000 for it, um, which I'm kicking myself now. But um, we finally be, were able to buy a small lot and build our own passive house, um, which my husband built himself, and are trying to make it a sustainable way of life. I'm now a midwife, I'm working in Vancouver, and um, a friend of mine who's also a midwife is from the Squamish nation. And she said she really wants to come back and live in Squamish and serve um, her community, but it's too expensive. Um, so I'm going to do my best to make that happen for her. So I really hope that you enjoy the rest of the evening. I'm going to invite um, our panelists up and introduce you one at a time. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, Charlene Joseph, um, who you have already met. She is from the Skohamish Nation and, and um, is a language and cultural teacher. Uh, she just graduated yesterday um, with her master's <laughs> Masters of Education, so congratulations. Um, Abby Lewis is a documentary filmmaker, journalist, climate justice advocate, federal NDP candidate, and strategies director and co-founder of The Leap, an organization launched <laughs> in 2017 to, up, um, to append our collective response to the crisis of climate, inequality, and racism. In 2008, uh, Abby co-created and became a longtime host of Al Jazeera English television, te television series Fault Line and acclaimed weekly documentary series. So welcome, Abby. Please welcome Peter Hall, who is a professor of urban studies at Simon Fraser University in Vancouver, Canada. His research and publications examine the connections between port cities, seaports, and logistics, as well as communities, local economic and employment development. Between 2012 and 2015, he directed the reclaimed, uh, Reclaiming the New Westminster Waterfront Research Partnership, which include museum, education, labor, community, and academic partners. And last but not least, Nick Gottlieb is a climate communicator, activist, and community advocate. He has a master's degree in ecological design thinking and focuses his work on drawing connections between the myriad of crises we face today. He works to expose the underlying causes common to the climate and ecological crisis, today's rampant inequality in housing and affordability, and everything else and to explore how we can challenge those undercurrents and rebuild the possibility of a livable future. So the intention of this panel is to look at the changing of Squamish in relation to the most uh, pressing issues we face at, um, in a society. All around us, there are social, political, economic, and environmental issues that stem from deep systemic problems and uh, problems and the imposition of one worldview. 
we need to look beyond climate change and the mindset that less bad is good. And to start discussions on how we as a community can ignite deep change in a good way that transforms our relationships with the earth and each other and to have both respect and responsibility for people and place. We want people to walk away not with a sense of complacency and hopelessness, but with empowerment and force. So the panelists are encouraged to engage with one another in these conversations and to kind of free flow. Um, I will keep an eye on the time. I encourage you to be aware of airtime and let everybody have um, a chance to speak. Um, I will cut you off if need be. <laughs> um, being very ruthless. Um, so the first question that we will start with um, stems from um, stems um, with the critique of powers. So an often heard complaint in Squamish, like elsewhere, is that our leaders do not properly listen to the community concerns and bend to the whims of affluent developers and industry. Locally and globally, the power is held by fewer and fewer hands who do not represent the community, yet heavily influence how, how our community and world is shaped. So the question is, Going beyond democratic means, example, voting, town halls, or even peaceful protests. A, how do we hold corporate developers and government accountable to their promises and to be in line with community values and social responsibility? The second question, more importantly, how do we put and keep the power of decision makers in the hands of the community so that we, the people, can create a better world? I hand it over to you and I hope that your uh, speakers are functioning. Um, is that yeah. I, I think there's kind of two avenues I want to talk about this from. Um, and one is sort of the perspective of, of engaging with local government. Uh, and you know, you, you talk to our city councilors about that or the mayor, and you hear from them that when they do more engagement, they hear more about dog poop. Uh, and then sort of the flip side that, that's less talked about is that they hear from neighbors who think we should close the municipal campground because it has people who just got out of prison and they're next to their one and a half million dollar homes. Um, and that's sort of who the current municipal engagement system hears from. Um, and so, you know, when you go to the city council and you say, we need to engage more, like the public doesn't feel like you're hearing from us, they don't feel like more engagement is positive, and I, I understand that perspective, but I think that the challenge is that we need to transform the way that we're doing engagement and public participation, um, because the existing ways that engagement happens prioritize hearing from wealthy landowners and basically people who have time and wealth to make themselves heard. Um, I think there are some really interesting approaches to that that are going on at local government levels. Um, I think participatory budgeting is one possible approach. I think citizens assemblies, especially in sort of the, the era of climate emergency when we have like really big, important decisions to be making. I mean, uh, I'll throw one example out here, right? Like we're, we're developing huge amounts of space in the floodplain, knowing and at sea level, knowing like the entire ocean front development, we know that in the best case scenario, we're gonna have to abandon that in eight years. Uh, that's the best case scenario. And, and we're like totally ignoring the long tail of risk of much higher levels of sea level rise. So I think, you know, citizens assemblies are a way of sitting down as a community and saying, do we want to expand, like there's there are trade offs. Do we expand at sea level because we already have infrastructure there? Uh, or do we grow out into the side of town? I don't know. Um, but these are decisions we can make as a community, not sort of just driven by developers and, and people with, who own property. Um, and I'll just briefly touch on the other angle, that, which I think uh, maybe is more what Tom Cena was talking about, which is the sort of prospects of building alternative systems um, to, to, to create power as a community um, rather than going through elected government. And I think there are some really inspiring sort of things to look at there in terms of community land trusts and like tenants unions and just sort of ways of organizing 
and taking power as a community away from the developers and the elected representatives. Am I on? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Feeling a little bit of like a slacker not in my league up here. But. <laughs> uh, so I can um, only speak to um, uh, just my own experience and uh, I'm not uh, speaking on behalf of uh, my nation or even my family, but just from, I've lived here of course since um, the day I was born and my family's been here about 10,000 years or more. <laughs> um, so we've definitely uh, seen a lot of change in Squamish. I've seen a lot of change in Squamish. Um, I still remember when I seen uh, the first 7-Eleven coming into town and I was so excited. Little did I know what was to come after that. Um, I wish I knew the answer to that question, <laughs> but I know um, like for us, uh, like for Indigenous people, um, we often feel like the unheard um, and actually for a very long time have been completely silenced um, in having in any decision making that's happening within our lands and basically having land stolen. So um, the only thing that I know, and it's hard, it's frustrating because I know that the community oftentimes thinks, oh, the Squamish Nation has so much power. Um, the Squamish Nation has the, the, the potential to stop, you know, um, certain developments or industries from coming in and and the truth is is that uh, oftentimes our leadership doesn't feel that way or I think most times I, they don't feel that way um, it's sort of that same you know in the long ago I heard a story about Chief Joseph and he was um, basically told that you know you need to sell us these lands if you don't sell us these lands we're going to take them anyway um, and you get nothing and I think that's still kind of the mindset of Indigenous people is that, you know, um, you know, that when we've fought against our leadership with against certain industries, they're like, well, we have to just get, um, you know, force their hand and do the best that we can to get them to, you know, to, to be respectful of the environment or to get as much as we can um, from this development because whether, you know, whether we say no or not, it's going to go through and at least this is where we're getting something out of it. I think that's kind of the mindset. But what we've done, um, me and my family, is just make sure that we become educated and that becomes a part-time job in itself, going to all the information events and reading up on all of the uh, information that we can find and talking to friends, um, you know, on the outer fringes who, uh, you know, who understand the issues better than us and then making sure that we go to all the meetings that we can. And I find developers are often really don't know what's going on within our communities when they're coming in. Um, my sister, before she got on council, she went to a meeting and um, she was looking at this map and um, she was looking at where there was really dangerous, um, potentially lethal um, uh, a compressor station that was meant to be put right by our house. And um, she asked the, the man who was running this uh, info session, um, like, is this, this is where this compressor station is going to be. Like, there, was a, there was a potential that this thing could blow, right? That, I mean, it's happened before, and if you're in the vicinity, then anything within a certain distance, anybody would be, they would be dead. And so um, he said, yeah, that's, uh, but it, it's, it's, so it's, this is the best place for it because there's no um, residential area anywhere near here. And she's like, my sister's house is literally right there. And he said, what? Oh, uh, uh, you know, like, and he was, a, he was there at the info session and he had no idea. And, you know, we had to go to every single meeting and I had to start out, stood up at every meeting and said, this is not okay. This is not okay. You're putting my family at risk. Um, and it was funny because we went to three different meetings and it was the same info session and the guys were greeting us at the door and they were like, this is basically the exact same presentation you seen last time. I'm like, yeah, we know. <laughs> <laughs> but we made sure to stand up and say, you know, what um, our concerns were. And so we did get some of our concerns addressed and we did get the compressor station moved. So um, I don't know, for us, uh, I don't feel like um, we've had a chance to make any really big changes, but I know for us, it's just grassroots level, it's just being informed and making sure um, to, 
to go to all those um, those meetings and have our voice heard. Well, uh, thanks so much, Nola, for uh, for inviting me here. I've um, got to say that as a, an academic, to have uh, been able to come and visit a place um, and uh, do a bit of research uh, in a place, particularly want to recognize uh, Annika Aris, who was a postdoctoral student working with me, who spent a lot of time here. Um, we had a, had a visit here um, a few years back, um, and uh, Eric Anderson, who's now one of your counselors, um, showed us around. Um, it's, a, it's a privilege to be able to come back and um, you know, talk about uh, um, some of the ideas and the work that we were doing, and, and meet people who actually read uh, read what we wrote. So thank you. Um, uh, and and I and I think that's a that's a sort of starting point uh, for me. I, I completely agree with um, what uh, what the other panelists have said so far about um, the importance of showing up and um, putting pressure on the local council. Um, but you're you're not alone. Uh, and and if uh, and if academics can help show that there are examples and processes going on elsewhere and communities elsewhere that you can connect up with and learn from and learn with, um, that's one um, hopefully way of going forward. Uh, the second thing I'd, I'd say is to really um, make sure that you're paying attention to the decisions and processes that are being taken outside of your community that have a profound impact on your community. So um, I don't think um, what's going on in Squamish today can be understood without understanding the, the highway, uh, the decisions that were taken um, around uh, the, the rail corridor um, that goes through your community. Those have as much to do with shaping what's going on here as um, as any decisions that get taken at council, uh, the the those those processes are important, and um, they connect you to other places in ways that are you know sometimes advantageous. They're, they're sometimes about um, getting uh, getting access to jobs and and and, uh, and so on, um, but they are also processes that can fragment. Um, what, what's already probably a very difficult community to hold together. Um, you do, I, I understand there are parts of Squamish that are more connected um, to Whistler or to downtown Vancouver than they are to other parts of Squamish. That makes it very difficult um, and to, to plan and think as a community, but let's know the challenge um, uh, at least. So, um, Last thing I'd say on, on this line is that um, with this kind of um, uh, connection and penetration and fragmentation, it's really important to pay attention to the commons, um, uh, the, the things that actually um, give uh, people a sense of a common destiny and a, and a, and a, and a framework to work around. So um, there, there, there are ways that, that councils can um, to pay attention to shared facilities, to shared infrastructures, to shared spaces, to the kinds of um, uh, physical um, and, and other things that local governments do that actually give people who live in a place to, to understand their common interests. So um, with that, I'll pass on to Evan. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for that welcome. It's, it's, um, it's beautiful to be welcomed in, in such a meaningful and powerful way. And the story of the song, has, I think, is exactly the way to frame this discussion. This first question is about power. How do we build power as, uh, as families, as community, against the powers that make the decisions that shape our world? And, and to just pause and think for a second, that um, you know, 115 years ago, um, a, a group of families came together, built the power in their coming together to go and confront the king on the other side of the ocean who was making decisions about what happened here on this land. And they were thinking of us when they did it. It's just an incredibly powerful, um, story to, to shape how we consider these things. 
Uh, I've spent a lot of time as a, as a journalist and a storyteller, and the film This Changes Everything that we saw the trailer from um, was a long work that I did with, uh, with Naomi, my partner, um, going around the world to look at community struggles that were on the front lines of the climate emergency and of fossil fuel extraction in particular. But they were all stories of how communities came together to try to advance, um, to try to advance a, a system that prioritizes life over profit against the extractive and, and punishing forces uh, that prioritize profit over everything else. And this has basically been the struggle since the beginning of capitalism. The notion, and, and one, one of my favorite photographs uh, in this entire series is that one right there, um, because the notion of private property itself, the, in, the original enclosure of the land, and the idea that individual humans could own a piece of land. I mean, the land owns us. This is, this is one of the great lessons that we've learned if we've been listening to the original storytellers of this place. But that initial act of individual, assertion of individual ownership over what cannot be owned is, is still exactly what is happening in the explosion, explosion of development uh, around Squamish. It's still the, the original principle of the accumulation of capital is, is still what we're confronting. And there is nothing that can stop it or change its course except for organized people, except for communities in action. And so the question is how we build power as a community to confront these epic and historic forces that are shaping our world in ways that we know are toxic and negative to people and, and to the land. And I guess, um, so I just want to express appreciation to Thomasina as well for, for framing this vital conversation can seem a bit airy and head level stuff, but it's not, it's, it's the ground on which we fight. What I've seen um, in the last couple of decades of studying and in solid, working in solidarity as a storyteller with communities in struggle is that there are, there are two big components for me that you have to, that we all need to keep in mind, the no and the yes. The truth is, for organizers like Nick and others who have worked in the communities to like try to get people to get off their asses, to get off their couches and go and do something together, which is the initial, the act of the soul to get out of this passivity and into action. There's nothing like a big fat no to get people mobilized. <laughs> so fighting something is a really good place to start. And trying to identify something, it can be a project, it can be an LNG project, it, LNG project, it could be wood fiber, it could be that, oh sorry, I'm, I'm stuck on that because you refer to it very, very elliptically. Um, no, it, it, there, there, there's a lot of places where people can come together around a note, and, and, and organizing around a note is really important. It's a place where people get angry and people connect to each other and find common cause in trying to stop something. But that, as we've learned, is utterly insufficient to just be on the defensive and trying to say no to things. And ultimately, the no is a negative space and a negative energy to be in. And actually, we have so many beautiful alternatives. And Thomasina framed this evening and started with uh, little trailers from a number of films, which I'm realizing is an entire genre of like, you know, alternatives born, um, where, you know, genuine community-based economic alternatives to extractive capitalism are well-developed now. Um, 30 years ago, they were ideas, but in the last few decades, there have been a lot of community level alternatives, alternative currencies, alternative ways of housing, and, and settler societies learning from indigenous communities of older ways of doing things that are actually more about connection and about, and, and about what is common, or about the commons, as they said. Um, and so I think it's really important to infuse the no struggles with the energy and the creativity and the hope and, and, and the excitement of the yes. And so I think what we're really seeing in a lot of struggles these days is people coming together in anger and working together in love and building something in, in opposition to, uh, to the negative thing that they're trying to stop. Like the Tiny House Warriors is a really good example in Sequapunk territory where they're, they're putting this kind of like solar powered tiny houses, almost uh, uh, an emblem of a more sustainable way of living Connect and they're using them for traditional purposes, for ceremony, and they're plunking the future in the path of the past, of the pipeline, of the 19th century energy source that must be stopped, that must be left to the ground. So that's my opening gambit is the down the yes. Uh, thank you 
so much. The second question revolves around system change. Does anybody from the audience have any questions? We were sprinkling in the questions. <laughs> <laughs> About that first topic. You can also save it to the end. So the second oh, question. Oh, yes. So I've been to council meetings, and can everyone hear? Sorry, grab mic. Please. Don't worry. Don't touch Um, I've been to council meetings, you know, with a couple of hundred people. Huge number, 50 or 60 get up and speak. 49 of them out of 53 speakers are against the project. And the council then duly gets up and votes against the will of the people. And this is something I see a lot here. Um, we're exercising our power, we're trying to get together as a community, we're trying to you know, pull our values together, and yet we're not being recognized. Um, is there anything that can be added? Okay. Ooh, next guy. Yes. <laughs> you in? Uh, I mean, I think anyone who's been in Squamish and listened to some council meetings over the last few years has seen that very clearly. Um, and I, I, for the councillors here, I don't want to blame you personally. Uh, I think there's a lot of systemic issues at play here. Um, and that's why I think we need, uh, you know, when I was talking about a new paradigm of, of engagement for municipal government, I think that's on, that's on the district, that's on municipal governments to embrace uh, and to recognize that current strategies of engagement aren't working because they don't engage the right people, they don't engage the community, and also because they don't, they sort of like build this paradigm where the government doesn't think the engagement is working, they do it to check a box, they don't trust the results of the engagement because they think the engagement is messed up, which it is, and so it really isn't a system that actually allows participation, and I think, um, you know, for, for our municipal government people who are here, for people who are interested in municipal government, like, Pursuing a new paradigm of public engagement is the way that we can engage the community more and more meaningfully. Um, I think there's another challenge as well, which is that you know when you come forward as a citizen and speak your mind, regardless of who's sitting on council, you're just speaking your mind against the much bigger forces of power that are driving what's actually happening. Uh, and so that's sort of where building alternative systems and building power in other ways becomes really important. Um, and I, you know, I think that some of the sort of small films we saw talked about that, Avi talked about that to some degree, um, and definitely like the no and the yes. You know, we, we need to organize around saying no in ways that expand beyond just saying no at council and writing letters, because in many ways that just doesn't work. Um, and, you know, the, exactly how you do that depends on what the project is. It could be setting up a tree set, you know, blocking logging, or it could be uh, setting up a tree set to block a pipeline, but you can do things other than set up tree sets too. Uh, and, it, you know, it, it sort of depends on the, depends on the situation, but uh, I think sort of those, it's, it's important to recognize those times that we want to say no to things as sort of really what I was getting at, as critical junctures where we can actually leverage them to build power rather than just stopping whatever was happening and moving on. Um, yeah, uh, Spencer, I think that's a really good example of an organizing moment that maybe was missed. Because if you're talking about, um, if we're really thinking about it in, as organizers, if you clearly have a bunch of people on side and something undemocratic is happening, then you've already organized a bunch of people to get to a meeting. So you need to then organize to a level of escalation where you show that power that you've built in, 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 in a more intense action. And, and, and I think it makes sense to go in the front door and do things the way they should be done and do consultations and learn about the projects and do your homework and bring academics who really understand the weeds. And then, but the point of getting a bunch of people to a meeting 
is not what happens at that meeting, it's what happens right after. And so I think like people who really want to build that kind of community and want to build a loving and radical community need to be thinking about the next step after the meeting, assuming that things are not going to go your way. If you win, awesome. If you don't, you should have the next step planned already. And this is just an organizing mindset that has to do with like not, not ever squandering uh, a, a victory. It's a victory to get a bunch of people, to get a clear majority at a municipal process that's a victory in itself. It required a lot of phone calls. It required a lot of relationship building. And the question is, where are people having dinner after that meeting together to connect, to eat and share and play on a more radical thing next? So it really has to be seen as, a, as an ongoing organizing project, I think. And there's lots of opportunities for it. And I think we'd suffer from the same individualism and the same like isolation of different struggles where we're only there because we have a common interest in that one thing. And we have to think more broadly about building power at the base because we're connected by values when we all come together to go to a meeting. And we have to build on those values to the next project and the next one. Um, yeah, I just want to say something about that too, because I've definitely been in that situation. I've been pretty vocal against the vehicle resident, like the, you can't sleep in your vehicle van. I've lived in my van for, gosh, 25 years plus, and for me, it's a way of life. And it's something that is really the way I want to live my life. It's like it makes me feel more connected to nature. And when the district uh, in 2019 tried to pass a full camping ban on sleeping in your vehicle, I took it very personal, which is why um, it's kind of uh, helped energi energize me for this as well, because to me, it's all related. And in terms of being ignored, I mean, we had like 300 letters go to the council in support of inclusive policy, which is probably the most I've ever received, according to Nick. Um, and they all went ignored. I've never had a response from any of the counselors and the promises, they promised inclusive policy like six times, like publicly, and then they used COVID to uh, basically rile us up into this campground and then push us all out and then they closed the campground. And I believe actually the campground was closed as a punish punishment for us because of what happened last year. Um, so anyway, to answer your, to answer your question, what I think is like, I'm just not going to obey. Like if they pass a valid bylaw, I don't like when I get my knocks on when, I, when the bylaw knocks on my door, which they have multiple times this summer. It's really disturbing. It's super like it's you know my heart beats really fast. But I say to the bylaw, I am not moving. Like this is a wrong bylaw, and I think if something morally feels wrong to you that the district is doing, whether it's building a huge condo in front of the chief or building on flood plain or whatever ridiculous thing they're up to, um, I just think we should just keep saying no and just keep practicing moments of uh, civil disobedience when we can. I'm, I'm a fan of doing more radical stuff. I'm not I'm kind of done with writing letters and kind of done with petitions. I think that we just need to like stand up together as concrete people and, you know, start getting rowdy. <laughs> So the question too is uh, regarding system change. So although the theme of changing Squamish appears to be about housing and gentrification, if we look deeper, we soon see that these issues are serious side effects of something more of much larger. To quote Leanne Betasimosika Simpson, I'm really sorry for saying that wrong. The issue is that accumulation-based societies don't like the answer we come up with because they are not quick technologies fixed. They are not easy. Real solutions require rethinking of our global relationships to the land, water, and to each other. They require critical thinking about our economic and political systems. They require radical system, systemic change. The second question is, how do we as a community counter the forces at work, such as gentrification and growing inequality, so that we can create the necessary systemic and relational change that influences healthy and diverse lifestyle choices and improves relationships for the human and non-human world? Can you give us some examples of people-like change 
happening in the world right now. Now that's my fault, yes. <laughs> So my role, um, as mentioned, is in education, and I often, you know, for me, I feel like um, the hope um, lies for us and our children. You know, we've, uh, for a few generations, we've been kind of getting it wrong, um, and you know, thinking um, as a society that we need more and more and more, and having more is the best, and having more power is the best, and more things biggest house. Um, I remember growing up um, seeing that mindset and uh, beginning to emulate it, you know, as a young person. Um, but as I, you know, engage more with my culture and um, my community and learning more about, um, uh, you know, my history, um, have a, you know, I began to see the beauty of the way uh, of Indigenous worldview and way of being. Um, and started to really push against uh, the norm. What is what is the society say is right, and what does society say is the norm? And uh, I think that it all that's why I ended up in education is because I, I didn't really feel like I fit in this world. I felt like I wasn't the right fit. I always felt like I was born in the wrong time. And uh, so I started to share with children um, our indigenous way of being um, because for me it feels like we need to, you know, we can't. Well, you can't go back to living in a longhouse. Yeah, but we can go back to that way of, of living as a community um, and having those values, those same values, right? So in the long ago, um, the CM, the chief, the, the leader of the people, he wasn't the wealthiest. Um, he didn't have, you know, the biggest longhouse and a big hoard of bentwood boxes in the back with a bunch of small fish. You know, you were seen as wealthy, not by how much you have, but by how much you gave. And that's a different way of viewing the world. And I can see that, and still in my community today, you know, when families are in need, the whole community gives. When the family, um, you know, when somebody passes away, um, our whole family comes together and our community comes together, brings food, brings money. Right, and just making sure they're taken care of, um, and you know we feel comfortable living um, in a in a communal home, you know, um, and society sometimes tries to tell us in many ways that that's not okay, that you should be ashamed if you're living at home with your parents. Um, I would love to have my kids live with me forever, <laughs> and one day have grandkids running around in my house. Um, but we have to make those things okay, you know. Um, one of my coworkers and I was saying, you know, my daughter was having a hard time living away from her community, and I was going to school, university, and um, you know, I was saying, we need to find a way um, because our kids can't, they can't stay home and go to university, right? Like we have to leave. Um, go to the big cities and she wanted to get education but she was feeling alone and missing that community and so we want to find a way to build a community and support for our kids when they're away from home and um my co-worker said no we've got to make sure we've got to prepare them for the real world they have to be ready to go out there and, and live on their own they have to be able to you know live on their own in their own apartments and you know this is what the way you have to you know this is the way society is now and it's like well, no, it's like, why? Why do we have to change our children to fit into society? Why can't we change society for, you know, into the way, the world we want for our children, right? Why can't we, you know, I want, I want my children to need community, right? I want them to feel connected. I want them to want, because when you're a part of the community, something bigger than yourself, it gives you purpose. Right? It gives you purpose beyond just wanting the fancy car and the big house. Um, you know, when you feel connected, not only to people, but to place. And so when, with our education system, you know, the school that we're in, that's what we're all about. We're all about trying to create family, trying to create community. Actually, we're not trying, we're doing. We're creating family, we're creating community, creating connection um, to the land and, and to this place and bringing kids out to the same place many times where we're creating that love because you're not going to care for something unless you have a connection to it, 
Right? You're not going to care about your neighbor if you don't know who they are. You're not going to care about the estuary if you've never enjoyed it and you've never been there and you don't know what lives there. Right? And this is what we need to do, and that this is the change that this is where change comes. Change can comes for children. There's so much strength in the children, and I can see it um, in the children that I work with. And, and it's amazing to me that oftentimes the children are the ones that change the minds of their parents and the, and the adults in their life. I told a story to a little guy the other day, and he's like, oh, I'm going straight home. I'm telling my mom all about it. He's like, Good, you do that. But you know, the, the, when we hear things from the mouth of babes, you know, it touches our hearts in a way like no other things do. So I really believe education is a really big component and key to this. And really going back to all of us, all of us in our history come from a place where our ancestors lived off the land. All of us at one time, you know, our, our great grandparents, whatever, they got the medicine from the plants. You know, so many different nations, all nations had drums, you know, all of these things are not just indigenous people, things are so whole much things, these are a part of all of us. That's why when we, we get around those things, it feels so important to us, because we are all actually, um, you know, from our roots, we are communal people, and we need to go back to that, to teaching our kids about how, what it is to be part of community and family, and go back to that mindset and get away from this set, uh, mindset of, uh, needing and wanting um, power in things to feel like we succeeded. We need to make sure that, that we're teaching our children success is when you're able to, to give back to your community and to your world. That's what success is. And if we can raise our children in that mindset, then we can change the world. So what, one, of, one of the ways is, is through art. And that's part of why we're here tonight, uh, uh, because art, uh, art destabilizes our sense of the way things are and the way they should be. Um, there was a, a public art exhibit uh, on the New Westminster waterfront, uh, which unfortunately is gone when the, when the pier burnt down. Uh, but it was, a, it was a set of uh, ocean shipping containers turned on their sides to make a W. And so, if you really need to boost the town, then the W became a good way to boost the town. But also, if you wanted to remember um, that uh, there was a long industrial history in the town and that had changed, that was a way to signal that process and that understanding. And if you're someone who is frustrated by the container trucks driving through congested roads of the city, that was a way to maybe deal with a bit of that anger. So I love that piece of art because it actually, it poked at this idea that the, that the waterfront was just one thing. No, it's actually many things, meaning different things to different people. And, um, and so um, connecting that idea up to what's going on in terms of real estate development, I think um, all these phases of development whether it was resources before, uh, whether it's real estate development now, of course the proponents of those industries want the town to be the thing that they want it to be. But there's, there's something particularly um, uh, place shaping about real estate. Uh, that is, that the, the, the people pursuing that form of development need the town in its image and its self-understanding in the, in the investments made by local government, they need it to be about real estate instead of being about all the multiple different ways that people actually live in a place. You know, some people who just are, you know, want to live in a shack, some people who want to live in a truck, uh, some people who want to jump in the sea um, because their parents are making them look with them. <laughs> Whatever it is, and so, so, so I think I think part of part of this part of this um, part of this pushing back is having a more nuanced and complicated understanding of the places that we care about, because I, I think that's part of the first step of making sure there's space for all of us in our you know messy different ways. Um, and, and I think that's, again, to come back to the point about the commons, that's part of the spirit of the commons is that it's, um, it's places and spaces where, not where people get together to do the same 
and the brother will get together and be different, not just the one thing. Uh, uh, industry in this town is as much a victim of the real estate development as, as the natural environment. Uh, it, it's as squeezed out. Um, I just have a story, a little story to tell because you, you asked about people led movements um, that are that are making this kind of change right now. And um, so my first uh, featured documentary film was called The Take. It came out in 2004. And it was, um, Daily and I went down to Argentina, um, which had experienced an epic uh, financial crash in 2001, 2002. And in the wake of it, uh, workers in, in that country were abandoned. The owners took their money and went to Europe. There's a scene at the beginning of the film of billions of dollars being driven to the airport in the middle of the night, like a capital flight, like you know, visible. And Argentina had a really strong industrial economy and, and also had free post-secondary education since the 1920s. So the industria argentina, the made in Argentina, was like a famous phrase and encapsulated it this pride in production. It's a very kind of early 20th century kind of vibe. And so there were all these factories that got shut down that were profitable, that were working in communities, and workers started putting themselves back to work by seizing the means of production, actually, um, as a Marxist would say, but by just starting up their workplaces again that the owners had abandoned uh, during this crash. And they, they, so they were creating economic activity in their neighborhoods, to break the law and do it, to fight off eviction threats from the cops. But the, what was really interesting about it was that they chose democratic cooperatives as the form of, their, of how they organized their workplaces. And so the occupied factory movement or the recovered company movement in Argentina is now well over 20 years old. Um, and it's, it's, there's tens of thousands of workers in democratically worker-owned cooperatives that were formerly capitalist businesses um, and they've created networks of exchange, and they've created a lot of employment, and they were, and, but, but more fundamentally, they transformed their social relations, their relationships, from all of them working at the machines, facing away from each other, to sitting in circles and making decisions together about their production, about whether they made ceramic tiles, or auto parts, or shoes, or chocolates, or, or bread. They, were make, they make decisions democratically about every aspect of life in these businesses. So extraordinary movement that was really inspiring for a lot of people. Made this film, accidentally co-founded an organization. Someone saw the film, so had an idea that as long as we're still living in, in capitalism, that access to capital is actually shot to be a human right. Most worker cooperatives can't survive because the banks don't recognize the value of their businesses and they won't lend the money. Every business needs to make to, to take loans in order to buy raw materials, in order to like, just conduct their business. And so we started this organization called The Working World that made loans to only to democratic businesses, to worker-owned uh, cooperatives. And it, it started in Argentina, moved to Nicaragua, eventually came back to the United States, where uh, it's now like a $20 million a year uh, capital fund that gets loaned out to worker cooperatives around the United States. This has nothing, all that has nothing to do with me. I just was there, showed the film. The guy who started it is the one who started it. But one project that the working world has been funding just reached this sort of really critical turning point. It's this project called Crenshaw Rising. And I raise it tonight because it, there's, it's like a, a dystopian view of maybe Squamish in 30 years um, in, 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 in one sort of way. So there's this Crenshaw Mall in Los Angeles, which was abandoned after the real estate crash in 2008. So many of these sprawling commercial properties are just empty now. And the black community that lives there and that had lived there for, for, for generations came together and, and, and tried to take over the mall to build a commons. So local food production, healthcare, entertainment, theater, small businesses, um, worker cooperatives in a mall, <laughs> right? Which is just like, oh my God, the symbol of the hollowness of the consumer promise of, of our age. And, and, and the, the most depressing place on earth, of course, is like a shopping mall that's abandoned. So they've been fighting for years to buy this mall 
and they raised like 120 more than 120 million dollars to do it. I don't know all the details of the story, but they just got um, faced a major defeat over the summer when the owners of the mall decided to sell it to a totally corrupt developer, kind of Trumpian figure, for less money than the community had raised. And it was like the dream was sort of sold out from under them. The reason I tell this story is because that story is not over. They are still organized. They built this radical, organized community. They have a vision of what they want. They're working inside and outside of the system simultaneously. Now they're going to take it to their courts. They're going to keep doing direct action in the city. And they have a vibrant, loving, radical community that has come together to oppose the forces that displace people on racist grounds, as they always have in the United States around real estate, and here too, and also to assert their alternative, which is a beautiful, connected, and cooperative, uh, healthy community. So that struggle, while they've just hit a big impasse, they didn't go home after that defeat. They stayed in the streets, and they're going to fight by any means necessary, because they're so connected to that struggle. So I take a lot of inspiration from, from struggles like those. Um, I just want to build a little bit of what Peter was saying about uh, sort of the interests of, of real estate. Uh, I don't want to say developers because developers are sort of the oftentimes the specific people building things, but real estate capital interests, um, you know, in, investment trusts and, and large firms. Um, and he's right that it's crowding out industry in our town. It's also crowding out uh, sort of through the cost of housing. It's crowding out retail workers. It's crowding out restaurant workers. Like it's about, I mean. It, basically, every restaurant is short workers in town, and it's not because no one wants to work, despite what you know, right wing media wants to say. It's because no one can afford to live here and work at those wages. Um, but I think we're kind of at risk of falling into this this big trap uh, because you know, there's a housing crisis in across Canada. I think it's we're feeling it uniquely bad here in Squamish and in Vancouver. Uh, but you know, across the entire country, housing prices are out of control relative to incomes. Um, and as a result of sort of a, a confluence of factors, including you know, macroeconomic policy over the last few years, over the last 20 years, sort of greater trends in, in financialization of assets. And there's a lot, of, a lot of different things at play, but what we're being sold to solve this problem, and you know, we, we saw this, we see this locally in terms of saying we need to like accelerate market development in order to lower the cost of living. Uh, but we're also seeing it federally, like in the, in the federal election, Trudeau, committed something like $40 billion to cities to fund housing development, which is a good thing, but it is going to be prioritized for cities that, uh, you know, their words were basically like create accelerated pipelines for approving developer permits. Um, so they want to give funds to cities that can actually get stuff built, which is, which sounds good, but what it's shaping up to be is giving funds to cities that essentially entirely deregulate the development industry. Um, and so we're, we're being told that there's a housing crisis. We need to build more homes, true. Uh, and the solution is to totally deregulate and give more public money to private companies because they'll build more homes and then we'll have cheaper housing. And you know, I say it like that, it sounds absurd, I hope. Uh, it is absurd. <laughs> But it's sort of this terrible trap that, that we're being suckered into. Um, and, and I think you know the, the key there is, is what Peter was saying, which is that real estate capital interests have interests. Their interest is not about getting people in homes, it's about making money. Um, and I, I read something recently by this guy, Cory Dockero, that I think is sort of really instructive on how capitalism solves problems like this. So the housing problem is both a supply problem, we don't have enough houses. And a distribution problem uh, where you know too many houses are hoarded by wealthy people while other people can't afford to live in any house at all. Uh, and if you you know you go to the, the free market, the market fundamentalist, and you say, okay, like we just need to solve this problem by adding capital and deregulating. And they go in, and, and this thing by Cory Doctor was an example of where there's a new startup uh, you know in the, in the Bay Area as they are that has decided that IRS call centers in the US uh, take too long. And so they're going to solve the problem by spamming all of the IRS call center lines, buying, like locking them all up so no one can get through, 
and then selling spots on the call center list to the person, to the people who pay the most. And this is how, you know, market fundamentalism solves, solves distribution problems. Uh, and of course, it doesn't take much thinking about it to see how that doesn't work for housing because people need houses. I mean, people probably need to get through to IRS call centers too, but like housing is much more fundamentally important and it's much more of a problem if we're allowing that to be solved, solved in these same ways. Um, so I think, you know, as this housing crisis deepens, we really need to be vigilant that uh, both locally and, you know, and who, we, who we elect federally, that the solution is not just to give more free reign to large capital interests to further exploit and, you know, marginalize people for their own profit. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions? I was told to move this one. Okay. Um, so this question is about different worldviews. Um, so there are two things I've heard recently that I found really significant. The first came from Randy Lewis recently at the uh, First Truth and Reconciliation Day. And he said that over 30,000 Spohomish people lived in this territory. And the second came from poet Kevin Paul, who's actually one of my professors right now. And he quoted an elder, so it's a quote from a quote, but he quoted an elder as saying, if they keep building all these single family homes, pretty soon all we are going to see is houses and the people are going to become divided. So like both of these things kind of made me like, whoa, okay. <laughs> like first, like the impact that our culture has had on this land, like environmentally, and then socially, the impact of separating families, which Shara had already talked about a little bit. Um, just the fact that people are becoming divided. And like, I mean, even recently this week, there's been some, or like last week, there's been some really sad stuff happening in Spanish. And to me, this is just a symptom of this problem. Um, and yeah, so despite, okay, so despite the unsustainable impact environmentally and socially of current patterns of growth, this Eurocentric way is often seen and imposed as the only way of living. This is reflected in homogeneous monocultures which are happening not in, in Squamish, but all over the world. Simultaneously, words like uh, rest, <laughs> reciprocity, reconciliation, and revitalization are becoming more commonly heard and bring with them endless possibilities for healing and change in a good way. So this is a two-part question. It's kind of an important question <laughs> for me. It's very, it's the most important one. So first, what might indigenous or decolonizing approaches to knowledge, agency, and land have to teach us about looking beyond climate change and to all aspects of our environments, inner and outer, social and personal? And second part, connection to land can build respect for the environment. However, if someone does not have that connection in the first place, how do we as individuals and as a society learn to be in good relation with the human and non-human world? In other words, how do we cultivate good relations? So an easy one. Home. They want to stay home. They want to live here, but 
um, the sad reality is, is that they can't afford to, and that's crazy to me. And the only reason I can live here is because my aunt, um, who, you know, uh, bless her soul, she left me her house. If she hadn't left me her house, I couldn't afford to live here either. You know, I wouldn't be here. Um, and it changed so fast. You know, it changed so fast. Like my daughter and my son, when we were renting, we had a three bedroom for seven hundred dollars. Like that was cool. You can't even get one bedroom shared in a house for seven hundred dollars now. You know, it's insane. And so we have families that um, had to move away, and then they can't even afford to live within North Vancouver, um, within you know our territories there. They're moving farther out, and then they move to the west. They can't afford to live there. Now they're out in Surrey, and now we have people moving out into um, different provinces, and, you know, to Chilliwack, and those other areas because they can't afford to live here. And it's crazy to me. Um, and you know, I was talking to a friend, and I have a lot of friends in the um, environmental activism um, arena, and uh, I remember one of my friends was feeling really downtrodden about losing a battle, um, you know, one that we fought really hard for. And she was saying, you know, I don't know, I think it's time now. This town is changing too much. And uh, I think it's just time to move on now. It's time to move somewhere else. And I said, see, that's the thing is that I don't, I don't have that option. That's not something in my spirit I can do. You know, we are tied to this land. My ancestors have been here for generations and generation and we've been told we have responsibility to this land you know to be caretakers of this land um, for at least seven generations forward and so no matter how many battles um, we lose we have to keep fighting because we have no other option and sometimes we fight the same battles like for the estuary for three generations you know there's there's stories about Great great grandfathers fighting, you know, a coal port for the estuary. And then there was a, uh, my uncle who fought in the deep sea port. And then there we were again fighting for the estuary. I had my daughter there. So now we're talking like five generations of uh, my family's fighting to protect this estuary. Um, and that's a, and it, it really had my friends stop in their tracks. And it's just like, we really thought about that. You know, the fact that, you know, I, as a settler, I move and, and my family moves and, you know, we're not as tied to the land as, you know, as, as your people are. Um, and how much it hurts our spirit to, to not be able to be here, to live here. Um, you know, those stories I don't think um, get told or don't get felt. And I think, you know, when you hear somebody's story, um, it touches your heart in a way that nothing else can, you know. Um, and when you see the faces of those people, you know, I have a family from my school who loves this town so much and loves their schools, and not even Skokomish, but you know, in, you know indigenous. Um, they're trying to stay here because they love this place and they love our school and um, a large family, and they and they <coughs> will rent to them and they can't afford anywhere. And so now they're forced to live in a in a camper with a whole bunch of kids and it just breaks my heart like I can't even imagine you know so I think there's just some stories that need to be heard um, you know and that there's voices that need to be lifted um, like I said you know oftentimes um, I don't feel like you know as indigenous people we felt like our voices mattered or you know that our voices um, that our voices would be silenced but I think we're in a time now where people's hearts are maybe a little bit more open and a little bit more understanding. And I think the more we can hear other stories, um, the more we can. And now, I don't have the big, the big answers like these fellas here. <laughs> I don't know the ins and outs of the, uh, you know, capitalism and all that. But for me, it's all about. Um, I'm always about heart, and I'm always about people, and everything changes with individuals. Um, and so for me, touching the heart is, is where things are, whether it be um, revitalization, um, you know, reconciliation, all those things are about relationship. And it's all about um, having caring for something other than just yourself. Um, and I think that 
Um, oftentimes, even the coldest heart can be changed by the right story. So good stories, Lloyd. The thing, the thing about uh, academics is that we, um, we we learn to look at things certain ways, and uh, so perhaps the one of the ways we look at things is through numbers, and, and that's a very powerful way of looking at things. But it it means that you have to believe that what you're looking at can be captured by a number, and uh, and there are many things that can't be captured by numbers. Um, and, and another way we know things is we say, well. If everything else was the same except for this one thing, uh, you know, how, and then, we, and then we look at what that one thing, that difference that that one thing makes, and again, that's a powerful way of looking at things in it, and then of course it's completely inadequate uh, when it comes to understanding the, the complexity of, a, of, a, of an actual situation, an actual place, an actual person. Um, so, um, so I think part of it is, 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 is certainly stories. Um, I got to tell you that my students love the take, um, and and one of the one of the most challenging uh, moments in that movie for them was um, was when um, when the uh, when the, the group the main group went into the factory for the first time and we were sort of overcome by emotion um, being back in this in this place and this group of uh, you know well-meaning sustainability conscious students were just absolutely overawed by the fact that somebody could be so attached to a, a factory, yeah, to, a factory to, a, to a dirty place. Um, but Well, they cleaned it up. That was the first thing they did. Well, of course. <laughs> <laughs> um, the story allowed them to see um, the people doing that as multi-dimensional, real people, not just, you know, worker unit or something like that. Um, and and I and so I mean I think I think part of the part of the approach to learning um, and understanding and drawing on the, uh, you know, trying to learn from indigenous ways of understanding this is to understand the, the complexity of, of any situation um, and the, the, the connections between the different parts um, and so for many of us uh, that starts with a bit of unlearning about the way we. Really trying to find the, the connections and the, the, the complexity um, uh, that uh, that you know, make actual people. Because again, you know, Squamish is not one thing. Uh, it's not. Uh, it's not whatever the latest slogan. Yeah, I'm just Yeah, maybe I'll, I'll sort of take two different tracks on this. Uh, I, I think uh, you know, Charlene talked about how. How these sort of worldviews are, are about relationships, both with, with other people, with the more than human world. And I think what's really important to recognize, you know, to, to contextualize it and talk of capitalism, just what we're doing on this side. <laughs> um, I appreciate the <laughs> It's important to recognize that, that the idea of recognizing and valuing those relationships is itself a revolutionary act against the ideology that underlies capitalism and sort of the, the Western world, you know, you, you can say sort of Eurocentric worldviews, um, you know, which, which, which we often refer to as capitalism. Um, but I, I think that sort of, you know, we're, we're constantly, uh, we constantly have this image of uh, being people who only act in atomized self-interest, sort of, a, a, we're told that we're a rational economic man, you know, which is a crazy concept invented 50 years ago. Um, by men. Yeah, yeah, and uh, and and it's a you know we're told that in so many ways we're we're bombarded with it with advertising we're we're sort of it's just normalized all the time and it's it's how many of us have been raised and um, so every time you you know you like take time and you you sort of embrace a relationship or you recognize that there is life that is a human these things are all sort of acts that challenge that governing ideology and help to overcome it. Um, 
And I think, you know, when, when we talk about organizing and building power and sort of community land trusts and, and uh, taking over manufacturing and democratic ownership, you know, you can, you can try to do all of these things. And if you don't do it, if you don't understand that you need to approach the doing of it differently and sort of valuing the relationships and the process, not just sort of like looking to pursue this outcome and, you know, have a productive democratic, democratically owned workplace. Uh, so like, if you don't recognize that you need to do it differently from the ground up, then you're just going to reproduce the original thing you were trying to get away from. Uh, and then maybe, maybe kind of on a, towards the second tack of the question, you know, as a, as a settler, and I think probably for a lot of indigenous people raised in Canada today, you know, we're, uh, it's hard to reconnect. Um, and I think that, you know, for me, I see it as a, as a lifelong journey of trying to relearn how to live in relationship with other people and with the more than human world. Um, and we are in Squamish, I, you know, I think uh, outdoor recreation is a really interesting piece of that um and I, I i don't have any answers really but i think uh you know for those of you who mountain bike or run or ski or whatever else you do there's a there's a tendency here and, and across these sports to sort of treat them as a transactional relationship with the land where you're just you're just taking you go out you know you ride the trails it's like going to the ski hill almost it's like you're pedaling uh and I would really encourage people to try to think about how they can transform the way that they're doing those activities in such a way that they're really like recognizing that, you know, when you ride through a forest on your bike, you're engaging with all of the more than human world in the forest around you. I, you know, it's even much easier said than done. Like I said, it's a sort of a lifelong project to try to, to understand that. But I think we have a tendency here, you know, at the outdoor recreation capital of Canada, to sort of pursue this stuff in, a, in an abstractive way. Uh, and I, I think it's a really interesting and difficult, but important challenge to try to change the way that we do that. That was beautiful. And I think it's, it's so true. Um, I wish I could answer this question with a short film because I, I made a, a short film on this subject. Um, it's called Message from the Future 2 because it's a short film, but it's a sequel. <laughs> um, the years of repair and because what we're talking about now is we're talking about an economy and a society and a culture because it's a question about culture I think not about organizing and power it's a question about culture we're talking about a culture based on care where care is at the center of our value system and that care extends to each other and it extends to the life support systems on earth our mother and to all of the all of the more than human uh, life that, that surrounds us, um, and I think the pandemic has given us um, a unique opportunity. I think a historic opportunity to see these connections. So the little film that we made um, starts with hand washing. Um, remember at the beginning when we were all like YouTube videos, like have you been washing your hands wrong the whole your whole life? <laughs> Hands and singing happy birthday twice. <laughs> um, and, and then we were suddenly all so aware of what we had touched and who had touched what we were touching. And that was an opportunity. And I think I think our culture embraced it actually for a minute, where suddenly so much of what is invisible in consumer in our consumer culture sprang into life and into visibility in front of us because when we thought about who had touched the things that were being left at our door we could suddenly see the amazon drivers who were invisible before that because we were thinking of their hands and we could suddenly see the people who packed the boxes and we could suddenly see the people who picked our food the temporary foreign workers that the agricultural industry uses ex extracts from and suddenly we started realizing that people in the middle of a pandemic who were picking our food when they got sick. They were sent home. They're not allowed to access health care here. And they were living in barracks with no privacy and no separation between humans. And they, th those conditions were dangerous in the pandemic. And suddenly we saw a whole economic system of how our food is produced and how our goods are made and delivered 
and these connections, these human connections were lit up for a moment as we saw what was essential. And so we have a lot of work to do, um, especially as settlers, to repair. And the fundamental work is to see care as the animating spirit of our culture and of our society, and of the reason that we come together. And the thing that keeps us apart is not seeing care as an organizing principle. And repair is the work of reparations, of paying for the damages that we have done to the people and the land that, that, our, that, our, that our modern consumer society uh, rests on and continues to damage every single day as its daily practice, as best practices of, of, of modern business. But repairing is also, uh, and here as always, I'm indebted to the thinking of many people who have gone before me, but especially the brilliant woman that I live with, Naomi Klein, who talks about repair in its original sense of repairing. We have been cut off from the things that sustain us. We, that the original act of commodification, an academic might say, or of seeing something separate from you and it has value because it's of use to you, is a, is, is a, is a cutting off, is a separation of ourselves from beings embedded in a circle of life, in a web of life. And so we need to repair, we need to reconnect, we need to pair again um, with the forces of life that sustain us. And that's what gets people building tree sets. And that's what gets people to a community meeting. And that's what gets people to dinner to tell the stories afterwards, which is actually the point of the dinner. Um, and that's what brought us here tonight. And Thomasina gave us a principle of care that, that allowed us to repair in this moment and come together. And I think that is the work. And, and, that, and that's why I'm so grateful to be invited to this. Because it's a yes for me, because this is the spirit that we need that is, that is calling to us. Are there any further questions from the audience today? For our lovely speaker? Or for Thomasina? Yeah, I've got a question. Yeah. Do you either speak loud or you can count them? Yeah, I'll try. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. So just thinking of development or what we're here tonight, where, where is it, do you think, someone like me can either learn about it or speak about it now, but what, what tools are the council members not using? Or what is it about accountability that, like, how do you track this stuff and actually say, well, you know, if it's about getting along and being communal and, and learning about each other, you know, the, the elected members fall into that category as well. So how do we track what they're doing in a way that's helpful and educate ourselves about the tools that we actually have available to them? and where the leverage points actually are for them. Uh, because ultimately, if that's where the decisions are sort of happening at the end of the day, um, that seems like really important. So I'm just kind of wondering what's wrong with that. That was huge. Um, I, I think that's a good question. And I, I, I should probably start by saying, uh, you know, something you're getting at, I think, is definitely true, which is that the municipal governments are also, in many ways, like between a rock and a hard place in this situation. Um, you know, have the, the housing costs are a confluence of factors over multiple decades, most of which have not been under municipal control. Um, and the toolkit that's available to fight that is small, uh, and it's it requires I guess courage <laughs> uh, and innovation, and and it's an uphill battle. Uh, and I don't think the municipal government can can go it alone in any sense. Um, in terms of how we as citizens help encourage that battle, uh, you know, I think I think uh, I guess I, I can't give you some resources right now or the microphone, but I think like learning a lot more and like reading about communities that are doing really innovative stuff around. Uh, trying to both accelerate development of actually affordable housing that actually supports our community uh, and simultaneously like not allowing the community to just be dictated by the interests of capital. Um, there are really cool examples of that in, in some places around the world, around North America. Um, and I think, you know, the more we can do to 
uh, bring that stuff to our counselor's attention, uh, the better. At the same time, um, it almost doesn't matter who's in office to some degree. You know, they, there's, they can vote differently on different things sometimes. Uh, but there's all this sort of other stuff that's impacting it. And I think that's why, um, you know, we can, we can do what we can to encourage the right decisions to be made that can be made. But when it doesn't work, you know, as Spencer was asking earlier, there are other things, sometimes things need to escalate. Uh, and that, that may be the answer sometimes too. Um, I, I just say pay, pay attention also to your public servants, you know, the, the professionals who are employed by uh, municipal or regional district government. They, their job is to explain the way the system works to you as as much to, to the councillors and, um, and, and hold them to account. You know, they're, they're, they, they do shape decisions um, over time uh, through their interactions with the development industry. But first and foremost, they're they're employed by you, uh, and they're and they're and they're there to um, to give advice, professional, informed advice. So sit down with sit down with some of the professional staff, um, get to know them, get to understand uh, why they're um, you know why why the city's doing the things the things it's doing. There was another question in the back. Yeah. Hi, uh, I'm one of the announcers on Chris Pettigo. I really appreciate this opportunity and hearing from people. Uh, there's been a lot of good things that have uh, been really thought provoking. Uh, I want to add a couple of quick thoughts. You know, I think all of us, we're, we're community members and we care deeply about this community. Uh, and I think we actually love to hear from people.
and then what we see with our kids um, having you know not enough places in schools for our children to go to school um, what happens if there's a huge forest fire and that sweeps across or a flood and how are we going to evacuate with the thousands and thousands of more residents that are going to be here what are you know what do, what do the development um, projects have to do to uh, donate to our local hospitals because they are not sufficient anymore to look after the, the increased population. And so with these, you know, the, the increase in their residential, their resident taxes is, is great, but what do these new developments, what kind of responsibilities do these huge developments have to, have to do to come, to come join our community? Um, I think that's something else that that's another conversation that's come up because I, I do see the, the just for our upcoming generation the decrease in re, in schools or or healthcare um, that we are experiencing. Um, I did a really bad job cutting people off. I didn't even do it once, but apparently I'm fairly on time. It says, it says conclusion nine o'clock ish. And so I think we're kind of 9.03. So, um, so I, although I, I, I wasn't ruthless as I promised, um, I, I didn't have to be you. You <laughs> yourself quite well. Um, I, I would love to hand this over to Thomasina to conclude as she was the mastermind behind this amazing event. Um, and I, I, I certainly wouldn't do it justice with my two hour ahead um, kind of preparation. <laughs> Thanks, Gus. Um, I don't want to leave this on a critical note, but um, regarding like, you know, what Chris was saying about checking the showcase and checking the new thing that they have, I mean, I still, that doesn't give me any kind of good feeling, to be honest, because I went to the website, the showcase, and it's incredibly hard to use. And I'm a pretty smart person, and if I, was less inclined, like if I didn't know how to use, I don't know, Facebook or I don't know, like there's people, there's a lot of people that do not know how to use the internet or that don't find it friendly. And that website in particular is like incredibly uh, slow, incredibly difficult, and it doesn't make it easy to find out all the stuff that's happening in this town, which I think is actually purposefully done. Um, and the other thing about the new Squamish thing, speaks thing, that I saw that. And I just don't have any faith, man. Like, I'm sorry. I just like, I just like, I've said, like, we've talked so much about things and we've talked and we've talked and we've talked and I've seen so many things, like the gentleman was saying at the beginning, like so many projects be um, people saying, no, no, we don't want this. And then council will just go ahead and do the complete opposite. And I've seen council use certain words to say that this is good or we're being, we're, we're being sustainability or, you know, they use the right dialogue, which is, you know what, um, Peter's paper was all about like the use of right dialogue to market things and to make it sound appealing and make it sound good, but in reality, it's it's not what's actually happening. And I find this very um, disheartening. And I honestly, as a student of political science, I don't think I don't think we have democracy anymore. And I feel that the only way for me the solution is actually what Abby was referring to in these films about people taking their power back. And as a vehicle resident who has been subjected to bylaw and exclusive policy for just the way I live, I feel like the only solution to this, because we've been ignored so many times and we've done we've done it a different kind of way, we've protested, we've showed up, and we've been ignored the whole time. And we have like I've counted all the letters that they've received, and it's most of them are for us and they're in support of inclusive policy, and we just got shut down. And I think people can only fight so much until they get hired, they get tired and they give up. And so for me, to me personally, the only way I feel is almost like what Emma Goldman was saying is like, if, if, if they may, if democracy actually work, if voting actually work, they would make it legal. And I, I, I think that this is just another way of pretending that things are going to work. And I would love for you to prove me wrong. That would be the best. But at the same time, I'm prepared to um, 
do that move, do that action that I need to do about just one example would be the vehicle residence. Like I'm just gonna keep sleeping on public land because as I was saying in the beginning, like this land and Shar was saying, like this land is not like the bylaw officer said to me, <laughs> he said to me, this is district district owned land. I said, no, it's not, this is public owned land. No, 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 this, this is district owned land. I was like, no, 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 this is public. Like, I own this land, you own this land, we all own this land. And I feel like at the end, like, the whole thing about land is like, we need to see it as a collective thing. It's not something to be commodified, it's not something to be destroyed, it's something to be respected, and it's something to build a relationship with. And as a vehicle resident, I mean, I sleep outside, I wake up outside, and to me, this is a way of living which brings me into relationship with the world. And, um, I think it's not something that should be shunned or stigmatized or seen as unworthy or as um, one council member put it, undignified. I mean, that's just their way of seeing things. And I hope if anything, we can kind of just see things in a different way and um, that people will rise up because I, prove me wrong, Chris, please. <laughs> but like, I really think that the time has come for us to actually just start taking, taking it back and mm -hmm. Um, community, like for example, community garden, the one that's in the photo there, it's going to be gone uh, probably next year. Uh, a lot of people, that place is not just a community garden, it's, it's like a, it's a community place where people, it's space, it's what Kieran um, called, or the Japanese called Mu, and it's like something space that we're kind of losing here because we're coming so claustrophobic with all these buildings that we're losing the space that we breathe and that we can like, you know, take a little time out in, and I think that this is life and we should be respecting it and not commodifying everything um and garden uh food um yeah we should be taking the land back and putting gardens everywhere like they do in that movie and to me this is what this is about so i hope y'all i hope i can see y'all like doing something that's taking it back because i'm not gonna wait for the government um, yeah <laughs> and thanks everybody for showing up i really appreciate it